Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban wrapped up his visit to the United States tonight, not with a sit-down in the White House with President Biden, but with a visit to Mar-a-Lago for a confab with one of his biggest fans, Donald Trump. That comes one day after Orban met with Trump whisperer Steve Bannon and participated in a discussion with the president of the Heritage Foundation, the conservative think tank. Those moments were apparently so memorable that Prime Minister Orban made a sizzle reel of them for his Instagram followers. Now, if there was any misunderstanding about the point of Orban's visit, check out the title of his panel yesterday, The Future of Relations Between the U.S. and Hungary. And from the looks of it, the prime minister is very much hedging his bets on a future that involves Donald Trump. Joining me now is Jacob Heilbrunn, editor of The National Interest and author of the new book, America Last, The Right's Century-Long Romance with Foreign Dictators. Mr. Heilbrunn, thank you so much for being here. And this book is coming at, at such an important time. I just, I'd love to, if you could talk a little bit uh, about the sort of relationship that I think national security hawks have been uh, examining in recent days between Vladimir Putin, Viktor Orban, and Donald Trump, and the degree to which, as The Guardian reports, there are legitimate fears that uh, Orban could use his access to the Kremlin to effectively promote Russian propaganda, especially regarding Ukraine, to Donald Trump. Well, Donald Trump has not been monogamous in his love for foreign dictators. He, had his bro he has his bromance with Vladimir Putin. Now he has a man crush on the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. And for Orban, Trump is a deliverance because it allows him to use his small landlocked country in Hungary and play the role of intermediary between Putin and Trump. And the question today, the most important question hanging over this meeting with Trump at Mar-a-Lago is what did Orban communicate to him about the future of Ukraine? and Putin's intentions, because Putin, Trump has announced that he could solve the Ukraine crisis in 24 hours, which essentially means handing it over on a silver platter to Vladimir Putin. It would be, it would be very interesting to learn exactly what Orban told Trump today. Yeah, well, well, we will probably soon find out, because when Donald Trump says something, the Republican Party usually falls in line. Um, beyond just Ukraine, though, it feels like Orban's style, if you will, of illiberal democracy is more easily mapped onto the politics of the Republican Party compared to Putin. Can you just talk a little bit about the way Orban governs his country and how Republicans and why Republicans have so thoroughly embraced it? Definitely. I was at CPAC last year, thought I was banned from attending, and the speakers were worshipful about Hungary. What do they admire? They admire that there is no independent media in, in Hungary anymore. It has been sold off to Orban's cronies. The judicial system has been eviscerated. They have elections in Hungary, but they're a sham. All of these things serve as a blueprint for Trump's own designs in the United States. He has said that Orban and I are almost like twins. And I don't think anyone should have any illusions. If Trump were to come to power, he would try to implement what Orban has done in Hungary, which means not shooting, not killing people, throwing them out of the windows, as Putin does, but a much more subtle form of eviscerating American democracy and above all, the rule of law. I do wonder what you think about, it's not just sort of the MAGA crowd. There are kind of Republican institutions like the Heritage Foundation, which has always been arch conservative, but used to be a place where neocons went. That they are now hosting, they are now hosting Viktor Orban. And there seems to be a sort of meeting of the minds happening there. And what are the implications more broadly for a part of the Republican Party that has been less obviously magified? Well, it's no question that the Heritage Foundation made a conscious decision to jump onto the MAGA bandwagon, and it did start as an insurgent movement inside the conservative movement and inside the Republican Party. In a sense, actually, it's returning to its roots. What I try to show in the book is that for the past hundred years, there has been this tradition in the Republican Party of dictator worship. So it's not totally a surprise that Trump and the Heritage Foundation would embrace this. In fact, it's the culmination of an older Republican tradition. Yes, the Paul Weyrich and the entire sort of grassroots new right movement that was born in the late 70s and early 80s are 
are their back, if you will. It's a righteous sort of battlefield soldier mentality of taking no prisoners and seizing the day. And I just wonder, you know, as we talk about these parallels between what happened before and what ha is happening now, you spoke to the Washington Post about the, the sort of the, the connection between the fascists and the isolationists in and around World War II and some of the positions that Republicans are taking today vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. Sure. We're hearing the exact same language. In the late 1930s, we were told that uh, Great Britain was doomed to defeat and that we should take the side of Nazi Germany. And today we are told Ukraine is doomed to defeat and we might as well cut a deal with Vladimir Putin. Nothing could be further from the truth. If we aid Ukraine, it will win this war. But you have these same defeatist appeasement voices that we heard then. We hear them now. They were wrong then. They're wrong today.